This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Floods, storms, wildfires. A hotter climate is wreaking havoc on the planet. The UN said it's now or never to limit global warming, and many have pledged to achieve net zero emissions. Countries, however, continue to sleepwalk into climate catastrophes. We need to give it a further push because we have very little time. In the case of climate change, there is no such thing as a free lunch. The disparity in financial needs between developed and developing countries remains controversial. How can we enact global climate justice? It's a systemic change with a positive perspective. We have never to separate social justice. The multilateral system has become more fragmented than ever on the multiple threats. Is there still hope for solving the climate crisis by working together? Science has never been more compelling unless we come together. We're not going to resolve these big challenges. Join us this week as we talk about how we can tackle climate change by investing in our planet. Only on Biz Talk, only on CGTN. And welcome to this special edition of Global Climate Talk on CGTN. I'm Guanxing in Beijing. Experts say dysfunction in supply chains and energy shortage will lead to higher costs for consumers, businesses, governments, and ultimately the environment. What can be done to promote investment to build a green economy and secure a sustainable future? How to get business leaders on board to take bold actions? What can be done by governments to incentivize necessary industrial and tech innovations? To explore these issues, I'm very delighted today to be joined by three distinguished guests. Lauren Fabius, former French PM and now President of the Constitutional Council, IF and board member, and also former Chair of COP21, who helped forge the landmark Paris Agreement. Welcome to the show, Mr. Fabius. Hello. And Eric Sawham, former Under Secretary General of the UN and Executive Director of UNEP, and currently uh, Ms. Soham is President of Green Belt and Road Institute, also a Senior Advisor to World Resources Institute. Uh, Mr. Soham, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Nihal. Thank you, Nihal. And Marco Lambertini, Director General of WWF International. Uh, with more than 30 years of conservation leadership, Ms. Lambertini has one of the world's largest and most respected conservation organizations. Thank you so much for your time today. A recent UN analysis of the war in Ukraine uh, kind of suggests that as many as 1.7 billion people in 107 economies are exposed to at least one of three risks, food, energy, and finance. Uh, Mr. Fabius, how will the ongoing Ukraine crisis affect our ability to mobilize financial resources to meet sustainability goals? I would like to quote uh, my friend, the UN Secretary General Guterres, uh, recently saying, we are sleepwalking to climate catastrophe. We have uh, to change things and the different reports uh, which have been made, uh, particularly by IPCC, and uh, the facts that we are facing are very clear. But we are not going in uh, that direction uh, in a satisfactory way. Uh, about finance, obviously finance is, is key. Um, I would say private and public finance. I uh, personally think that all our institutions I mean uh, public banks, private banks, IMF, and so on and so forth, must insist on the fact that if we uh, want to have a livable future, uh, we have to do more. From this viewpoint, uh, there are commitments which have been made and which must be fulfilled. Remember the famous $100 uh, billion which have been promised in 2009, and they had 
uh, to take place in 2020. We are now uh, two years after, and uh, it is not yet uh, met. Therefore, we have to insist on this public uh, uh, support, uh, because it's not only a question of mitigation, but also on adaptation. And if you want to adapt the different uh, economies, you have to have public financing. There is a financing gap and uh, there is also a say-do gap. Uh, Mr. Soham, um, you know that we, to some extent we can understand uh, you know, countries are now facing multiple challenges. Are you worried that financing climate action is no longer among the top priorities? Let's see the environment degradation and climate change as a fantastic opportunity for creating jobs and making our economies more, more vital. President Xi has said green is gold. It's an enormous opportunity to create welfare and, and, uh, and new and better jobs. And that's also why companies all over the world now tend to be ahead of governments, not hiding behind governments. Many American companies are far ahead of the American government. In Europe, the furniture maker, the Swedish furniture maker, IKEA. In Indonesia, April, the biggest paper and pulp company in the world, a world leader. And in China, of course, Huawei, Tencent, basically all the big companies of China has made substantial climate promises. So the key is to change our thinking into all the win-win opportunities, good for economy and good for ecology at the same time. So do you agree that we are sleepwalking into a disaster? I believe that we have put the train on the right track. We are moving in the right direction. However, we are not moving fast enough. Now, every major company in the world understand that you need to move into the green economy, but we need to give it a further push because we have very little time. And Mr. Lambertini, what's your view on this? Where are we now in providing much needed financial resources to combat nature loss? I would want to stress these, these two dimensions which are interconnected, climate and nature. We are beginning to understand that actually the destruction of nature, the destabilization of climate are having a direct consequences, not just on the natural world, but on our own lives, on our economy, on our well-being, on our health, uh, on our future, on the future of our children. And so this is a new awakening. This is a deep cultural change in our civilization, the way we look at nature, not anymore as something that we can take for granted, but something that we need to start to, 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 to care for. And now, um, uh, this cultural change, uh, it's happening, but it is not yet translating in the systemic change that we need to see. It's about uh, uh, embracing a new development model that is uh, carbon neutral, nature positive, that uh, respects the environment, to look at nature as an ally, not as an enemy, but still generates the wealth the, uh, and, and bridge the inequality gap that we are suffering uh, uh, today. Coming up next, Financial differences between developed and developing countries result in differing abilities to address climate change. How can we assist developing countries in meeting their financial requirements? It's actually about creating market-based incentives. Can we expect more aid for poor regions in COP27? My strong wish is that in Egypt, rich countries will meet their commitments. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks, and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz talk. Only on CGTN. The impact of climate change hits around the globe, but it is more severe for poorer nations than for richer ones. Poorer parts of the world are disproportionately affected. A S&P Global Ratings analysis says that climate change could reduce global GDP by 4% by 2050. That's with poorer countries' economies exposed to climate risks four times more than richer nations. 
The developing world argues that it's paying off the debt of the developed countries. And、uh, let's talk more about the、uh, the argument between developed and developing economies in terms of finance and needs. There has been a debate between the two sides about their responsibilities and commitment.、Uh, Mr. Fabius, we, we know this has been discussed about、uh, the Paris Agreement, and there is agreement on the、uh, differentiated responsibilities.、Uh, what financial challenges are developing countries facing? Because the, their,、uh, the developed countries are not delivering their commitments. In particular, this year's COP27 will be held in Egypt. How to mobilize necessary support for African countries to adapt to climate change and access financing? There is a particular inequality towards、uh, developing countries because some of them, African countries, are not emitting CO2, but they are the first victims of climate change, and、uh, this inequality、um, cannot be managed without public support. You have alluded to the next COPs.、Uh, the next one will be in Egypt, and、uh, my strong wish and support is that in Egypt, rich countries will meet their commitments that they have taken a long time ago, and this time these commitments must be、uh, met. It needs big change. It's a systemic change with a positive perspective. But change is not easy, and obviously, when you mean change,、uh, you mean having consequences on regions, on、uh, some particular people, and especially on the poorest population and region. And therefore, we have never to separate the technical aspect, the economic financial aspect, and social justice. Because otherwise, the population will not accept these necessary changes. Therefore, I insist on the fact that social justice is a must.、Uh, the fact that when the different governments publish what we call NDCs, the, the national contribution, they have to insist not only on the figures,、uh, the financial figures,、uh, the economic figures, but also on social elements,、uh, because it must be clear for population that. There is a possibility of a positive future. The world needs climate justice. Studies show that the richest 10 percent of the world was responsible for 52 percent of cumulative carbon emissions between 1990 and 2015, while the poorest 50 percent was to blame for just 7 percent. Developing countries have lower emissions, but are bearing the brunt of an extreme climate through more severe heat waves, floods, and droughts. A commitment made at COP15 of $100 billion a year in climate finance for developing countries was not achieved. We know that developed countries also said, and they don't want、uh, the financial aid to developing countries to become a liability.、Uh, Mr. Salham, how to bridge the differences? First, we must be fair. I mean, the Western arrogance, which we saw in Glasgow, where some nations were running around finger pointing to India、uh, as a culprit of climate emissions. I mean, let's let's be honest.、Um, North American climate emission per capita up to this point are twenty-five times Indians. So how can anyone blame India? India is not a part of the problem. India is a part of the solution because、yes. India is rapidly moving in a green direction. But let's point to China. So Chinese emissions are much lower than European or North American up to this point. But China is now rapidly moving ahead, providing the solutions. And that these the two biggest developing nations, China and India, can do a lot to invest in other developing nations. China last year produced eighty percent. Of all solar panels in the world,、uh, China last year produced more wind energy than the rest of the world has done in the last five years combined. China last year produced two thirds of all new hydropower in the world, and indeed, 99 percent of all electric buses in the world are running on Chinese roads. So China is such a lead nation among every technology we do need. And of course, Belt and Road provides an enormous opportunity for spreading these investments to Pakistan or Indonesia or Kenya or South Africa to all the other developing nations in different sorts of, of partnerships. When President Xi、uh, last year said that China will stop all overseas coal investment, 
Yes. That may have been the most important decision for the environment that year. And of course, it will drive Belt and Road into a vehicle for the renewable energies because there will be no coal. And the developing countries can play a key role uh, towards a net zero future. And uh, Mr. Lambertini, do you think more financial support is needed for developing countries or what are some other innovative ways to address this financing needs? First of all, we need the world to be together in recognizing the issue and moving in the same direction. The Paris Agreement has forged this powerful vision, global goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. The Convention on Biological Diversity has the opportunity to complement a completed job and, and develop a global goal for nature as well. Um, we are advocating for a nature positive global goal, carbon neutral and nature positive. These are the two global goals. Developed economies reducing their footprint in supporting financially the, a, a just and, and effective transitions in developing uh, uh, economies, but also developing economies had the opportunity and, and on one hand uh, also the imperative to actually embrace a new model. They have the opportunity to leapfrog all the dirty development uh, of, the, of the past decades happened in other countries and embrace a clean, a clean uh, and, and green direction. Innovative approaches is critical because it's not just about the more obvious finance um, that could come from uh, ODA, from developed countries to developing countries. It's actually about creating market-based uh, uh, incentives and mechanisms right. that can support uh, uh, sustainable practices in the sectors I mentioned before, agriculture, fishing, forest infrastructure. All that needs to become sectors that are carbon neutral and nature positive at the same time. Coming up next, there have been numerous commitments to green finance, but we have yet to see words aligned with facts. There is no room for complacency. We need to really shift a lot of our practices in key sectors and quickly. How can we accelerate the process of green investments? We need to give an introductory offer to fast forward this transition. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global business, only on CGTN. The private sector has an enormous role in providing solutions to climate change. We know that the private sector are often profit-driven. How to align the goals of the private sector and society? Uh, Mr. Fabi, as you mentioned, carbon pricing, uh, I think that is a very innovative way to, uh, to align the goals. Uh, what are some other uh, ways to do this, in your opinion? I think nearly everybody agrees that uh, it's an absolute necessity uh, to have a carbon pricing system. But, but, uh, one could say, well, uh, it's a good idea, but you have to pay attention to the fact that the level of developments of different countries are not the same. And therefore, IMF is working on a possible system where you would have different areas, different zones, and a possibility of a, a three-tier uh, system uh, regarding carbon pricing. And step by step, you can have a convergence of these different prices. But I think it's a good idea because it takes into consideration the necessity of giving a price to carbon. Carbon trading schemes are commonly used by governments in an effort to reduce carbon emissions. Carbon trading provides economic incentives within a market-based system by pricing emissions and charging polluters. It's considered to be the most effective method of combating climate change. The World Bank reported in 2021 that 65 carbon pricing initiatives have been implemented in 45 countries worldwide. The price of carbon emissions varies between countries, but high carbon emission costs makes greener industrial processes more attractive to companies. Mr. Sawham, uh, another thing to look at the, uh, uh, the, the green investment is uh, the green standard. A 2020 report of the UN Environmental 
group, environment program warned that only 368 billion of the 14.6 trillion in announced global recovery spending from the COVID-19 pandemic met green standards. How to improve transparency of green economy and how to unify different standards to guide investment? I believe, like Laurent, that in these issues, Europe uh, provides the leadership we need because Europe, uh, through the Green New Deal and the European taxonomy, is now making an all European system which will force transparency on companies and which will make it much easier for those who want to invest in the green and much more difficult, high interest rates are more difficult for those who want uh, to, 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 stick to, to stick to the brown. Let me give a very practical example of how we can move fast into change. In my nation, Norway, last year, 80% of all cars sold were electric. It will very soon be 100%. But how, this, how did this happen? happened because the government did set the right policies. No one wants to be the first person in the community to experiment with a car. So you need to give an introductory offer to fast forward this transition. So we changed the tax burden, electric cars became cheaper and the gasoline cars became more expensive. And we gave a number of in, uh, introductory offers to those who bought an electric car. They could go in the bus lanes, they put, paid less on parking spots, they paid less than the cross Norwegian fjords on a ferry. And, and with these introductory offers, people started buying electric cars, and then a number of people buy electric cars. The market takes care of the rest. Here there is a universal theory of change, in my view. Change happens when citizens demand change, when government regulates market and set the vision, and when you leave it to the market and to business to innovate, innovate and take change to scale. Uh, Mr. Lambertini, we know that uh, WWF is, actually, uh, is actively involving in uh, the uh, bio uh, biodiversity conservation in many countries. Or what are some of the best practice practices in encouraging private investment? Uh, we heard of uh, public-private partnership, and tell us more about that. I think we need to be very clear about that. There is no room for complacency. We need to really shift a lot of our practices in key sectors and quickly. Today, for example, um, there, is, uh, there are uh, much more subsidies as incentives going into the production of food, which is uh, based on the old fashioned approach of squeezing the soil, using a lot of fertilizers and pesticides um, versus uh, organic produced food. Mm -hmm. Organic food in many countries is still more expensive than traditionally grown food. That has to change and that can change if incentives and subsidies, both uh, uh, public um, but also private uh, uh, investment and incentivize towards a more natural way of producing food. And this is where the message of the Paris Convention on Climate has been so powerful, has created a clear direction, has created a level playing field, has sent a strong signal to markets that transition towards a carbon neutral future has to happen. The world agreed to that. In coming, uh, we need to agree on an equal direction for a nature positive goal, as I said earlier, where the world, the message to the market is, uh, similar in terms of shifting practices in the way we produce food uh, on land, we fish at the ocean, in the way we extract other, other natural resources, that has to be in balance with the planet. That message needs to be codified by the world and that regulatory dimension is super important to drive then a transition that will be embraced by the business and the investment sector. We've passed the time where we can uh, count on a few progressive companies or a few progressive investors. We need to uh, level the playing field. Uh, let's talk more about international cooperation. We've been relying on international cooperation to provide agreement and solutions to the global climate crisis. But now, uh, since the world's multilateral system is seeing increasing challenges, uh, Mr. Fabius, having forged the landmark Paris Agreement when you were chair of the COP21, you were often asked about the secret of achieving a universal agreement. Is it less likely to build consensus in a world which seems to be marked with more fragmentation? Well, we're able to, to have a success in Paris because we have been able to build a consensus between what I call three planets, the scientific and technological planet, clear, mm -hmm. uh, the society planet and the governmental planet. Uh, as a matter of fact, today, unfortunately, the governmental planet, I mean, the multilateral system uh, is in a sort of crisis. And uh, there is, 
I take the wording of Marco, there is no room for complacency. Because if we want to be successful, and it's true for climate change, and it's true for Kunming um, COP, uh, we have to bring together states, cities, regions, businesses, banks, civil society, and individuals. And we have, and it's not the effort of only one country, it's the effort of every country in the world. Because there is no frontier for uh, pollution. There is no uh, frontier for uh, climate change. And uh, Mr. Sohan, uh, you're always looking at the upside. Uh, I'd like you to talk more about China. Uh, the country is increasingly incorporated open, green, and clean targets into its BRI projects. Uh, what's your view on these changes, and how could it make more contributions to green development? China has changed a lot. I mean, 10 years back, it was true that China was extremely polluted, and now China has made enormous domestic transitions. Uh, and China is a global leader, I mentioned earlier, and a global leader of basically every environment technology. But China is also now a global leader of environment practice. China is the biggest tree planter in the world. Uh, President Xi just launched a huge scheme for national parks uh, in China, taking better care of the panda, the snow leopard, and many other species. China has launched the ecological redlining system, which is the best system in the world, as far as I'm aware of for protecting nature in difficult places. Uh, and China has cleaned up, say, the rivers in, uh, in, the, in, in uh, Zhejiang and Jiangsu province, and indeed now a fishing ban in the Yangtze, which is, of course, in the short term, a big pain, but in the long term, an enormous gain for the ecosystem. So the world has so much to learn from China. But for this to happen, we must avoid the geopolitical tensions, because if China on one side and the West on the other starting an all-out competition, cannot cooperate, everything will be difficult. And we should all realize no nation in the world wants to make the choice. Every nation, every African, Asian, Latin American, European nation want to be very close friends with China and very close friends with the United States all at the same time, because we see no need for making that choice. We can cooperate, invest, partner both with China and with the West, and that, that, that is the way forward. And Mr. Lambertini, we know there is an extremely difficult time. We have the Ukraine war, and we also have the rising competition between China and the U.S., the world's two largest economies. In your opinion, how can we further boost global cooperation? Uh, as Eric said, there will always be differences, and there will always be tensions. There will be some level of competition. This is the nature of our species. But that should not prevent uh, us to come together, us meaning the world, to come together, whether the common benefit, the common interest is so obvious. Uh, there is no going to be any winner uh, if we continue to destabilize climate or continue to lose uh, nature and uh, use unsustainably natural resources. Everybody will lose. Science has never been more compelling in telling us that uh, unless we come together, uh, we're not going to uh, resolve these big challenges. Well, thanks to all of you. We appreciate your time. So the key messages from our guests are loud and clear. To protect our planet and preserve our own livelihoods, we need more urgent action than ever. People, governments, corporations, and more need to make changes and to deliver. And in the end of the day, the Earth is our one and only home, and as many have said, there is no planet B. And we also call on our viewers to take actions, no matter how small it is. Together, we can make a difference. And that would do it for this special edition of Global Climate Talk on CGTN. Thanks for being with us. Until next time, bye for now.